hungry. Almost there. What city is that? Jezreel, the southernmost town in Galilee. From that river east to the Jordan River. Rabbi, where are you going? Do you need something? This way, friends. I'm sorry, but the map shows that Jezreel is two miles southeast of here and is met by a road east of the Jordan. We need to adjust our course 30 degrees We're to... not going to the Jordan. We're going through Samaria. Are you telling a joke? There's a place that I want to stop. Plus, it makes our journey shorter by almost half. And our odds of violent attack more likely by double. <laughs> Is that an exact figure? Forgive me, teacher, but it's safer to go around Samaria by way of the Jordan and not the Capulus. Would you join me for safety reasons? But, Rabbi, we're Samaritans. Good observation, Big James. What's your point? Rabbi, these were the people that profaned our temple with the dead bones. They, they hated they us. They fought they against us with the Seleucids in the Maccabean Wars. I've never even spoken to a Samaritan. And we destroyed their temple a hundred years ago. And none of you here were present for any of these things. Listen, if we're going to have a question and answer session every time we do something you're not used to, it's going to be a very annoying time together for all of us. We'll be fine. And if we get attacked, Simon will be happy to show us what to do. Absolutely. Right. So follow me. Last of Salome's bread last night. Master, we need to go into town for food. We can use the gold left for us at the fountain. Very well. There's a town about a mile west. Sikar. You all go. I'll wait here. Someone should stay with you. In case. I'm all right. Meet me at that well when you come back. Hey, what's up guys? Let's take a look at one of the scenes from Chosen the series. Let's look at how Jesus interacts with the woman um, at the well. And um, let's talk about it, okay? Let's see. Would you give me a drink? Did you hear me? That bad, huh? What? You, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan, and a woman. I'm 
sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the, the cool of the morning? Yeah, well, none of them will be seen with me, so I have to come out new in the heat, as you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I'd, I'd still like a drink of water if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would. Except that you have nothing to draw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Long story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know, Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband, then come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> oh, I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. But it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah. Exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. And the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank Him, even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit. And the time is coming and is now here. That it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. Heart and mind, that, that is the kind of worshiper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done. Do you believe what I'm telling you? <laughs> Until the Messiah comes, it explains everything and sorts this mess out, including me. I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married. But he wasn't a good man. He hurt you, and it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? 
I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know, but not by the Messiah. <sighs> and you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. <laughs> I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon, just the heart. <laughs> you promise? I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ! <laughs> Hey, wait! <laughs> your water! You forgot your um. Fancy, your man! You told me everything I ever did! <laughs> um, Rabbi, we got food. What would you like? Ah, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Who got you food? Wait a minute. You told her? Mm -hmm. And she can tell others? What food? My food is to do the will of him who sent me. And to accomplish his work. Y you told her where you are? Mm -hmm. So does that mean... It means we're going to stay here a couple of days. It's been a long time of sowing. But the fields are ripe for harvest. And so it's time. Let's go. Yes! <laughs> I think it's funny that, um, you know, they, they're showing the disciples kind of stressing out and worrying about food and what they're going to eat, where they're going to get it from, how long it's been and stuff like that, how far it is. Um, and Jesus always taught about not worrying about about tomorrow, not worrying about what you're going to eat. Life is not about eating and drinking. That's not what the kingdom of God is about. And, um, you know, it's about trusting God and things like that. So I think it's it's funny, you know, that <laughs> they're portraying the disciples uh, as people who are like kind of stressing up, stressing out about what they're going to eat, what they're going to do. And they keep questioning Jesus and kind of bothering him about it. So I think that's funny. Um, now, if you watch this series, you know, uh, of course, it's about the life of Jesus, um, but of course, they're, they're 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 putting personalities to the characters and and you know going according to the culture and going according to how the Bible um, describes certain individuals, and they're kind of you know uh, just making it. Um, believable, realistic, kind of making the people do things that they probably did or they could have did and just kind of putting us in there and showing us what, what could have happened, how things could have looked um, at that time in those days following Jesus. Uh, there's humor, there's personalities, um, there's frustration and things like that that we see. So, you know, of course, you know, not everything on here is biblical. There's a lot of filler. Um, and there's just a lot of just stuff, you know, realistic stuff that could have happened or, or conversations that could have taken place because of what we see um, written in the scriptures. 
You know, I like how they show Jesus um, as somebody who's not really sweating stuff, stressing about stuff. He looks at peace. He looks calm and collective. And um, at the same time, he looks focused. He looks like he's really trying to hear the father and do things according to what the father wants him to do. He's a man on a mission. And I love that it portrays that. You know, I love that it shows him um, at peace, but also focus also about his father's business. And that's, you know, that's definitely how we picture him um, wh while we read the scriptures and read his stories, um, the stories about him in the gospels. And uh, it's powerful. It's powerful. Now here, of course, we see the humanity of Jesus. We see, you know, we see him tired, breathing hard, um, which, you know, of course he was, you know, through all that walking, not eating. Um, we know he was born out of Mary, so he had flesh. He was a human. Um, he was God, but he was also human, right? So he was running out of breath. He was hungry. He was tired and all that stuff, but he still looked like he wasn't stressing about that. He was walking in the spirit and he was focused on what the father wanted to do through him with that Samaritan woman. Do you guys see how persistent Jesus is to this woman? He's so persistent. He's so confident about himself. He's so confident about the eternal life and the grace that he has to offer. You know, he's so confident about himself. And it just kind of makes me think like, wow. Are we this confident about him? Are we this confident about the gospel when we talk to people and approach them, when we go out to evangelize or just when we meet regular people on a regular day? Are we this persistent to speak to them, to allow the spirit to speak through us and to tell them um, what Christ has to offer? Are we this confident about Christ? I think we should be because Jesus has so much to offer. Everything he has to offer is everything that humankind has always needed since the fall. It's the good news. Amen. It's crazy because we see the woman expressing her frustration um, you know, on, on, on the religiosity of the time um, and, and the oppression or the, the culture of backlash uh, against her people, right, uh, in those days. And it's kind of like, you know, getting into a theological, um, the turning into a theological debate a little bit. Um, but Jesus is not concerned about you know, what the Pharisees and what, you know, the Jews have been have been doing or making up or or, you know, uh, using to to kind of oppress or kind of condemn others. Jesus is offering her the new thing that God is doing, the new thing that God is bringing. And he's, you know, obviously referring to the future where people will be able to get filled with the Holy Spirit and know God for themselves. Anybody, Jews and Gentiles, he's prophetically speaking about people being able to believe the gospel, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus and be forgiven of their sins and receive the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and know God for themselves, worship God for themselves, not in a temple, not in a building, anywhere and everywhere where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He's saying we're going to uh, we're going to worship God in spirit and in truth because we shall know him. We shall know the good news about him. We shall know about salvation, the truth, and we will be filled with his spirit and have access to the father ourselves. That's the good news. That's what Jesus was focused on. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't trying to debate. He, he, he didn't even agree with the things that were being done. He wants people to be filled with the spirit. So everybody who turns to him, everybody who calls on his name, everybody who believes and is forgiven can know God for themselves. Themselves, and that's the good news. Okay, the good news is not, you know, a lock on people, a control on people through buildings and rituals and services, which even today, a lot of Christians, you know, they try to apply that pressure to believers today. Oh, if, you know, if you don't come to church or, oh, only in church, you can do this or, oh, church this. And, it, you know, there's a lot of pastors who only focus about church and buildings and so, you know, old school, so old covenant that's so you know not the gospel not christianity you know they sh you know we we are to assemble but the focus should always be our relationship intimacy with god by the holy spirit that we now have 
That's new covenant. That's real Christianity, focusing on the spirit that fills every believer and the ability for us to access God and talk to him and pray without season and commune with the Holy Spirit. You know, so we got to focus on that. That's what Jesus is emphasizing strongly to this woman with grace, with love, with truth. And of course, by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that should be our focus too. So after Jesus basically prophetically preaches the gospel to her, lets her know it's not going to matter where you're from, what you've done, where you live, what race you are, you are going to be able to know God and worship him for yourself. After he does that, he starts operating in more um, of, the, of the gifts of the spirit. Now, in this scene, you know, he's naming the names of her husbands and, and facts about them and about their relationship and about why she's no longer with them that only, you know, only she knows and only the husbands know that, you know, he says so much that she starts to realize like, wow, like, who is this guy? How does he know all this? Now, of course, we know in the scriptures, he doesn't say the names of, of, of the husbands, um, but he could have, you know, I mean, he, he was getting words of knowledge about how many times she's been married and, you know, her current status at the time. Um, so, of course, you know, uh, Jesus could have got way more words of knowledge and words of wisdom, um, you know, to 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 show her that he is the Messiah even more, you know, to to, to, to let her know how much he knows, to let her know how deep this thing goes, you know. Um, and, and we could read about the gifts of the Spirit, um, seeing that words of knowledge um, are one of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit that we have um, and that we're able to walk in. And I mean, you know, Jesus is walking in, you know, a lot of gifts of the Spirit, you know, and all of the gifts of the Spirit. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know about the tongues or interpretation of tongues. We don't really see that in his life. Um, but we see, you know, everything else, right, in a major way. Um, so I think this just it's, it's a good picture of how evangelism could look like for us when we're hearing the Father and uh, we're being led by the Spirit and we're allowing people to see how real this gospel is, how alive God within us really is that he's able to speak to us about them in this way. And Jesus did that all the time. You know, you guys could go to first Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14 and read about that. You know, that's, that's the spirit's manifestations and the spirit has not left. The spirit is still on earth in the believers and he is God and God doesn't change. So he's able to do these things today for sure. Man, that part when he said, I came to Samaria just to meet you. That one hits you, you know, hard, you know, when you, when, just because you know how it affected her life and what she was going through before Jesus came into the picture. But also if it reminds you of your own, you know, your own drawing to God, when God was drawing you to himself, when God was kind of showing up and convicting you of your life and your sins and kind of letting you know he wanted to change your life and give you freedom from your sin and freedom from your depression. And, and, and he wanted to give you eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. Like if we could remember that time when God was calling us to him and when we said yes to him, it was like that, like I came to Samaria just for you. I met you at this bar just because I love you. You know, just because I want to rescue you from this whatever, right? From this alcoholism, whatever, right? You know, in my case, I was born again in a jail cell. I was born again while facing life in prison back in 2010, 10 years ago. And for me, you know, that hits different because it's like, you know, Jesus is telling me, you know, something like what he was telling her. You know, I'm speaking to you in this jail cell for your benefit. I led somebody to give you a Bible for your well-being. I led a, a jail minister to come and see you weekly for your soul to be saved, for you to receive eternal life. So it's it's powerful when you look at this scene and then you think about your own born again experience, your own initial faith in Christ that justified you 
is so powerful, so deep. The gospel is so about God's love, God's mercy and grace and wanting to deliver us from the powers of darkness, save us from our sin and wickedness and from the wages of it and fill it and, and he, him wanting to fill us with his spirit in order for us to walk in the spirit and continue in the faith and not go back to that sin, right? It's so beautiful because if you've read this passage in the Bible, you know that she went out with such you know, gratitude and zeal and passion preaching the gospel. She went out to tell everybody about this Jesus guy, about the Messiah. He told me everything about my life. He knew about me. Only God could have knew that the Messiah is here. He's going to save us. Salvation is coming. You know, she started evangelizing literally a woman, <laughs> a Samaritan woman, right? Because of, you know, words of knowledge, because, you know, Jesus' words of truth and of wisdom, of loving words, full of grace, prophetic words, and him just, you know, letting her, her know who he was and also letting her know that he knows who she is and him coming to save humanity from their sins. She went out and started evangelizing. That's powerful. You know, did we respond to our salvation like that? Did we respond to our encounter with the Lord when we started believing in him, when we realized, wow, Jesus is real. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. Jesus came to save us. He died for us. When we realized that and received that grace, did we start telling everybody in our city that we knew about what he did this has to be sobering and shaking for us today, guys. We have to remember we've been blessed. Like he's given us so much love and grace, so much forgiveness. We ought to tell people about it. We ought to lead people to him. We ought to be witnesses of this great work of the living God. Amen. Let's be like her and tell everybody what he's done for us. We are supposed to testify. We are supposed to preach the gospel and make disciples. I love how they added that scene where she just drops all the water that she walked such a long way to get, such a long way at the end of the day because nobody wanted to be around her in the morning, right? She walked all this way to get this water, worked so hard, you know, was probably so hot and so tired, and she just dropped it, left it, went off running, talking about Jesus because he had offered her living water. She finally understood the power of the living water, the difference of living water, the difference of Jesus between Jesus and Jacob's well, right? is powerful. She just dropped that water. I don't even care about this. How many of us, when we received Jesus or when we started getting serious in our relationship with him, we realized how powerful, how beautiful and wonderful it is to know him and to have you know, his grace, to have his spirit within, to be promised eternal life and, and to be promised an entrance into the kingdom of God. You know, when we started realizing this, when we understood the power of the gospel, so many of us didn't care about our careers. We didn't care about, you know, trying to date or, oh, who's going to be my wife or, or oh, I need a boat. I need to retire. I need to save up money. You know, a lot of times we, we, we let those things get in the way of our joy, the joy of our salvation. But if we think about what God has given us, what the Lord has given given to us through his own life, through his own death and resurrection, man, a lot of stuff shouldn't even matter anymore. For her, the water didn't matter no more. For us, our cars, our careers, hanging out, going out, friends, doing this, entertainment, football, so many little things that are like useless and are like so little and petty and, and just, they're not going to last. They're all going to perish. They're all going to go away. You know, they're all going to melt away with the earth. Like, you know, did we stop caring about the little useless things when we saw the importance and the greatness of Jesus? I think it's time to do that. I think it's time to stop loving the things of the world and stop caring about minute things. Like those things don't matter. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, if any man wants to follow me, come after me, he must deny himself and pick up his cross. You know, denying yourself is denying what your flesh wants to do. The, 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 the laziness, right? Or the drunkenness or the laziness. You know, a lot of times we don't even want to read the Bible. A lot of times we don't even want to spend time with God. It's like, what? 
you, you've been safe from your sins. You've been safe from hell. You've been given his spirit. You can know him. And, and, and we still don't read as if our eternity depends on it. You know, we got to think about that. But we spend hours on TV, hours on social media, hours at the gym, hours hanging out, eating with friends and talking. And it's like, wow, how much do we value Jesus and what he's done for us and what he has to offer to humanity? We got to think about that. She understood the difference between Jesus and that mere water, that just that natural water. The difference between natural and supernatural is crazy. The difference between worldly and heavenly is crazy. The difference between temporary and eternal is really crazy. We have to remember the eternal. We have to remember the kingdom of God. So even after all that, waiting, ministering. Jesus still didn't care about natural food. He still didn't care about it. He still was putting the things of the father first. It's funny how they have the two guys saying, what food, what food? <laughs> you know, a lot of us are like that today. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not, not just about food, but you know, we're always focusing on the little, you know, the little natural physical things, right? And, and we miss the point of what Jesus is doing or wants to do, you know? It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. We got to be tuned in to the spirit, you know, and we got to see the bigger picture, the bigger things um, in life. You know, Peter, I love how they, you know, how they put Peter, at, you know, looking back and asking the Lord, you told her, you told her, you know, Peter, you know, he was observing. He was, you know, looking like, wow, she ran off like that. You must have told her. You must have told. That's why you wanted to come here. That's why you don't even care about this bread because you just gave her some. <laughs> right? You know, and Jesus did say that about the harvest. You know, he was focused on the harvest. We must be focused on the harvest. He said the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. We've been called to be uh, his witnesses, his workers, his soldiers, his preachers, his messengers, his witnesses, his evangelists. You know, we have to remember there's a big, big harvest everywhere we go. We must start working, laboring, gathering. Right? Because Jesus died for all people. This is vital. I love how it just shows them walking out like a crew out on a mission, a crew that's going to change the world. Because in fact, that's what they were. A crew that was going to change the world forever and change eternity forever. Because all those who believe in him and follow him and keep his word will live forever with him in his kingdom. And that's powerful. Um, if you guys haven't seen this series, the Chosen series, check it out. I know the the, the URL is down at the bottom of the screen. Um, my wife and I watched it. We loved it. You know, we, we, we saw the parts that were straight from scripture and the parts that were fillers and that were add-ons just to give us an idea of what, you know, was probably taking place, could have taken place, um, and, you know, adding some humanity there, some, you know, people, you know, Jesus and his disciples having a real relationship, telling each other jokes and things like that, playing around, right? Um, Jesus, you know, dealing with Peter and his wife and his mother-in-law and, you know, eventually healing her like it shows in the scriptures, but... You know, I love this series. You know, I love it. You know, I think uh, it's common sense that, you know, when you read the scriptures, you know, Jesus comes in, heals, leaves, you know, and probably didn't really happen like that in real life. There was probably other things. He probably greeted somebody at the door. Somebody probably told him what was happening. You know, there was conversation, you know, uh, the Bible just says things straight, you know, straight up. But in, you know, Jesus, this is real history. Jesus was really there walking with people in real towns, real cities. Um, so there were conversations that were had. There were situations that that had to take place. You know, if we use common sense. So that's what I think Chosen is doing. Try to show us a real picture of what could have taken place in real life um, in addition to what's already written in the scripture. Um, and it doesn't veer off from the scripture. It doesn't, you know, do nothing crazy like shows Jesus getting married or, you know, sinning or, or something like that. You know, it stays in, 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 the, in the limits and in the boundaries of scripture as it should. And, and that's why, you know, I'm doing this video because I love it. You know, I was greatly blessed by it. Um, I think they're wanting to put out season two. So watch season one if you haven't. It's free. But they're wanting to come out with season two. And I can't wait to watch that. But I, I believe they're taking donations. I believe they're, you know, still raising up money to, to film and to put the, the content out. So if, if you guys go to that website, there's probably an option to give or to buy DVDs. And some of that helps them uh, to raise funds too. So 
You know, it greatly blessed me and I know it's going to bless you um, if you can, you know, get past the fact that uh, a lot of things such as these probably happen because, you know, this was real life or relationships in a real city, a real town. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So what do you guys think about it? You know, comment, comment below. Let me know what you think about this clip and let me know if you watched The Chosen and what you thought about it. Um, and if you haven't watched it, why haven't you? What, you know, what, what are your concerns about it or what questions do you have about it? Maybe we can answer them on the comments and, and maybe, you know, that's what you need an answer to, to, to decide if you're going to watch it or not. Uh, so let me know if this video bless you, hit the like button, the share button, let people see this and, uh, you know, hopefully it'll get more people to watch it. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, go ahead and subscribe and, uh, I'll see you guys next time. Let's grow in Christ. Amen.